For years, China has claimed to be ahead of us in the field of AI, and people have contested that claim. Well, China flew me out to Shanghai to see what they have in person. People in the know are bringing up certain academic work as proof that Shanghai might have human-like AI. But is China ahead of us? Look, China's not known for their transparency, but when it comes to submitting academic work, that's when you end up having to be a little more honest than you ordinarily would in government documents. So they did show their work in their recent math homework and we're gonna take a look at it and I'm gonna explain it to you and we'll see. Does China have human-like AI? All right, so let's talk about China's industry size goal. With OpenAI claiming that they want to raise up to $5 trillion in capital, $150 billion seems like a small amount of money. Because it is compared to $5 trillion. But the AI industry in the United States is also hilariously small right now, coming in at about $90 billion. In fact, Statista projects the growth of the AI industry in the United States to look about like this. Now, it's hard to know exactly how big China's AI industry actually is because they're pretty secretive about things like finances and government documents. To be fair, so is every other country on the planet. But the difference is that China tends to stretch the truth in what they release to the public. In fact, I'm surprised they're letting me be here in China talking about this right now. But here's the thing. I do actually think it's plausible that China could be spending a comparable amount of money as the Western world is spending on artificial intelligence. But there are some very distinct differences in how technology like this would work in China versus how it works in the United States, mainly just because of how data is managed and used in the two countries. China controls the information that their citizens consume. And the United States and the West are more toward the edge of free speech. Do you think that an AI model could properly learn in a controlled environment like the one that exists in China? Well, China has several different generative AI models and China's big response has been SenseNova 5.5, which is rumored to be able to beat ChatGPT4. It's the latest AI model from China. They call it SenseNova 5.0, which is supposed to kind of be a nod slash middle finger at GPT 4.0. SenseTime held its AI forum and basically talked about how cost effective and excellent their model is compared to ChatGPT 4.0. It is cloud-based and what they're advertising it as is that it's basically a way to have a conversation with an actual person except it's with an AI. And that implies artificial general intelligence. Okay, we do not have the data set that this model was trained on, but we do have the math. It's the same math as what we would use for a large language model in the United States. People in my comment section and readers of my email newsletter have specifically requested that I include more math in my videos. So we're gonna do that. If you don't like math, now you know who to blame. And there are chapters, so you could skip ahead if you would like. Okay, so here is how a transformer-based language model works. We're gonna represent each word as a one-hot vector. You have n words in a specific order. So then you get a n-dimensional one-hot vector. So let's say we had the word aardvark and we wanted to one-hot encode the word aardvark. How would we do that? It'll look something like this. It'll be a giant matrix that'll basically spell out the word aardvark as a one-hot encode matrix. Each word will be 100 dimensional because of English.
Okay, so now that we have established that, here is what a language model is supposed to do. In other words, this is the problem that a language model is supposed to solve. Okay, and we can do this with a function. Let me draw a picture so you can get an idea of what we're doing with this. So in order to not have a 100 by 100 space, I'm just gonna represent each of these one hot encodes by just a one dimensional matrix. Um, but you're gonna have to just remember that these are multi-dimensional matrices, okay? These are all linked to the same function and that will spit out a different one hot encode. So I'll just write it a different way. We'll say, let's say this is our one hot encode. And again, this is gonna be a multi-dimensional. Okay. Now, obviously having this kind of dimensionality is a combinatorial fucking nightmare. So we're going to collapse this. All right. That's why it's called a transformer. We're taking this giant ass thing and transforming it into something that our brain can actually manage, which would be something that is either one dimensional, two dimensional or three dimensional, not 100 dimensional. So we can kind of look at it like, this. It's kind of like casting a shadow of this giant 100 dimensional thing onto a three dimensional graph. Kind of like if you put a three dimensional object on the ground, it will cast a two dimensional shadow on the ground. So let's just say we have some points, okay? We have this and it looks kind of like that, all right? So basically what we're doing with this is represented by a function that would look similar to this. And we're going to use P for this, just because that, that'll be the, the function that I'm going to use for the projection. And then those, again, will go to another function, okay? And that will spit out a different WN. Uh, but this is a three-dimensional, so we can deal with that a lot better. Yay. One thing we'll notice here, this is just a neural net layer. Just like these W's and just like this F function and just like WN. Basically what we did in order to get this projection was we added an extra layer into the neural net. And in doing that, we have a function that is no longer a one hot encode function. What we're doing with this is we are predicting the simplest way to predict the next word, okay? And, and in order to do this, you can, you can feed it a corpus, or you can feed it a sentence, or you can feed it a paragraph, okay? It's one hot encoding that, and you pass that through P, and that goes through the F layer, and that's when you get the output like we had before. So this is just representing that in a different way, so you can kind of see, okay? And this right here is supposed to be the next word. And so this neural net is doing this over and over and over and over to get the next word. So, and we can represent this next word with a function also, and we can represent that mathematically this way. Okay, and in this particular case, P is the probability distribution over the symbols. So to train this, we want to minimize the divergence between the output and that one hot representation of the next word in the sequence. So we can write that like this. That would also be equal to this. And we can simplify that even once more. Okay. So if this model is actually better than GPT-40, like they allege, it's not just an LLM. It's likely combined with another algorithm. Most likely some sort of a reinforcement learning algorithm. We've discussed this combination in a few of my videos before. Okay, maybe more than a few comparatively to how many videos I've released. Um, and I've never actually gone through the math of how reinforcement learning works. So seeing as how I'm in China, let's do it. It starts with the premise of a multi-armed bandit problem. Here's a little bit about what I mean. Okay, so reinforcement learning deals with a sequence of actions that are taken at specific times. These actions taken should garner a large reward, like points in a game. So let's talk about the actions. Action A will be known as Q star sub T of A, which is equal to the expected value of the reward given the action selected. Now you don't know the value of each action. You will 
estimate it. And we can only estimate it at a specific moment in time. The goal of this problem is to make the estimated value or big Q to be as close as possible to the expected value Q star. Now, if we knew the values of these actions, we would obviously always choose the highest value, which is called the greedy action. This is called exploit. We are exploiting our knowledge that we know where the highest value is, kind of like knowing where the summit of a mountain is. If we don't know the value of each action, we could choose to explore instead, choosing an unknown value and hoping that it's higher than the value we know. Think of this like being in a Mr. Beast video where he asks you to choose a door and you can either keep what you get from behind that door or you can give it up to select a different door. So you select a door and behind that door is a bag of money. You can either exploit your knowledge of the value of that bag of money and walk away or you could explore by giving up that prize and choosing another door. And the prize behind the next door, it could be higher or lower. So in other words, exploit means taking the best reward for a single step. And explore means attempting to choose the best reward for the whole game. Okay, let's talk about this paper out of Shanghai AI Lab that talks about their recent advances in reinforcement learning. They invited me all the way out here to discuss it with you, so let's do it. This is a preprint. It has not been peer reviewed yet. They're using Llama with a algorithm called Monte Carlo Tree Self Refine. I'm just gonna call it MCTSR. And they're using it to explore different types of decision-making frameworks inside of a large language model. And here you can see that they have publicly published their code, which you can get from GitHub. I know some of you are following me from academic institutions and stuff, so I will link that in the description in case you want to play with it yourself. The reason for their research is to look at the notable challenges and areas that demand strategic and logical reasoning from a large language model. The reason why is because reasoning can cause problems with accuracy and trustworthiness of the outputs. Essentially, that's what causes hallucinations. So what they're doing here is they're creating a model that does not hallucinate. I'll let that sink in for a second. So obviously there's going to be a difference in how the algorithm will work if our data management structure is similar to what China does versus what the United States does. The United States tends to keep free speech more open, which means that the data has less restrictions on what could be considered a fact versus what could be considered not a fact, according to the curators of the data set. Whereas China keeps their data set more closed, so the curators of their data set get to choose what they consider to be a fact and what they consider to not be a fact. Regardless of whether or not that actually is a fact or a non-fact, we will set that aside for now. Okay, so if we restrict the data set, like what China does, you could end up with a specific type of error where the algorithm will learn from the training data set things that aren't necessarily important. And basically what ends up happening is the algorithm kind of memorizes things that are not important. We would call this overfitting. Now, the way that the Western world curates data sets, we have a different situation where we could end up with stuff in the data set that is incorrect. Google's large language model had a problem where it was trained on the onion so it was spitting out ridiculous stuff. It made headlines everywhere. Um, and that was underfitting. So what we would want, if we really want human-like artificial intelligence, would be something kind of in between those two issues. Both overfitting and underfitting can be explained very well in this video that my dog helped me make. Click here to watch it next. <laughs> 